no trial can recruit subjects until it is approved by the FDA, by the review board, whether it's within your own institution, or by a centralized one. Once uh, a trial has been approved for recruitment, um, it does get posted um, and awareness begins to go out there, whether it be through clinicaltrials.gov, whether it be through announcements within their own websites, um, the rare diseases websites as well. Um, and then we begin to get contacted by patients and or families and or clinicians. So um, many physicians or clinicians who are seeing these patients um, don't yet know much about the study. So they're not going to be able to explain too much about it unless they've had person-to-person -person contact with the principal investigator or the sponsor previously. So the families will see something about this study or hear something about it through their primary care or specialty clinician, and then they need to reach out to us. We can't reach out to patients. They have to reach out to us as a study site. Their usual first contact is usually with a coordinator. They're the ones who are listed by phone and email on clinicaltrials.gov, and they need to reach out and make that contact to say, can you tell me a little bit more about this trial? Um, what do I need to know about it? Is this something my child may or not, may not be able to take part in? They're, they will have lots of questions. Some of the questions will be answered right by the information that's on clinicaltrials.gov or the website that they're referencing, because it does have to list a little bit about the study, a little bit about what the drug is that's in, or treatment involved in that study, um, and it does have to list that inclusion and exclusion criteria that we've heard something about previously. Um, if they review that on the website, they may see obviously that their child does not qualify. However, it doesn't mean that they can't contact, and we do continue to get contacts from people because they may not have read it properly. They may not have interpreted it properly. Um, and they may want to know, are these hard and fast rules? Um, so most of the time, sponsors don't make um, exceptions to those rules. But it's worth a question to ask. Um, that contact is with a coordinator who explains about the study. Um, she's been, she or he has been trained in that study and the details of it. Um, and all of the commitments that would potentially um, need to be made by a family to do that. So that's really just a first touch base and explain somewhat about the study and what would be the next step. So as a study coordinator, um, since you're the first point of contact for a person exploring a trial, a parent of a child exploring a trial, um, we have that initial phone call with them. Um, there are certain things that we need to cover during that call. We almost have a telephone script, it's, and it's a printed out form that we would fill out so that we don't miss the questions that we should be asking them, um, it does, and then they can provide additional information as they like. This is not a screening visit. It's a, an informational call, um, but what we do want to do is, in a sense, pre-screen. Um, it's not a formal pre-screen pre-screen in the sense that we're asking some of the general inclusion criteria questions. We're asking information about their, the patient or child um, and what the background is for that uh, medical condition with that person, um, their current status in terms of who, where were they diagnosed and where might their medical records be housed. Um, because the next step to this phone call is to say, um, if you might want to be considered for this, our next step would be to have your medical records, the medical records forwarded for the investigators to review to see if this might be an eligible candidate. And that's still all the pre-screening process. Um, some institutions will set it up that they have these initial phone calls, which are just back and forth information with that family member, but then they schedule a pre-screening visit, which is, again, a telephone call. And it's after you've received the records, you have more questions about that child or candidate, and you ask an exact set of questions to obtain. You know, what was their last breathing test level? What was their last um, visit with the physician? And you may have outcomes 
that you're asking them in general to get an idea of their their level of disease at that point. Um, and then and then a, a screening visit is scheduled. Um, if it looks like the patient has is is potentially appropriate for the trial, there's no major exclusion criteria that you can see. Um, and then a screening visit is potentially scheduled for that patient. Now, prior to that, however, the next step would be to make sure that the consent form has to be forwarded to that patient and family um, to look over in detail, become aware of uh, what, what does this trial involve? What would be our commitments? What would happen to my child during this trial? How invasive is it? What activities happen? How many tests do they need to have? How many times do they need to be stuck for blood? How many time visits do we have to make to that hospital or facility? Um, so all the details are in the consent form. This is nothing that they sign, but it's informational so that they're able to read through that. Still, they can come back with questions via telephone to clarify questions they might have right up front but they have all that information prior to screening. If they then do still want to have their child screened for the study, they come to a screening visit. It does not mean that they've committed to that trial. It just means that they would like their child screened to see if they might be eligible. And if they're eligible, then they make that decision whether to be in the trial or not be in the trial. So they have the decision at all time points they're collecting information at all time points, every phone call um, up until the screening visit. But the screening visit is really where most of that information is transmitted between the investigator then, who goes through word by word of that consent form with the parent or patient. And so make sure that they understand all the details of that trial. Um, and we can speak more about what's in a consent form too. Okay.